Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 6th of May, and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 9th of May. And it's certainly been an interesting last couple of days with the obviously the Fed meeting on, on Wednesday, um, followed up by the Bank of England meeting on Thursday. And the difference in price action in a fairly short space of time, you know, begging the question, you know, what changed between Powell's Wednesday press conference to uh, Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England's Thursday press conference? And to be quite honest, the only thing that really changed was the tone and the narrative. I think there was a widespread sigh of relief on Wednesday evening when Fed Chair Jay Powell basically took the option of a 75 basis point rate hike off the table, while at the same time, obviously articulating a path of rate rises that was probably less um, severe than markets were pricing in. So 50 basis points taking the um, upper bound of the Fed funds rate to 1% with the prospect of a two more 50 basis point rate hikes by um, the end of the summer, and then potentially another couple of two 25 basis point rate hikes by the end of the year, taking the Fed funds rate to at least 2.25 or 2.5%. Also outlined um, the start of balance sheet reduction program that starts 1st of June, $47.5 billion um, going up to $95 billion a month in September. So far, so good. Um, US stock markets went sharply higher. You can certainly see that in the way the NASDAQ reacted on Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, wallop, all the way back down again. And I think for me, the, the obvious catalyst for the reversal on Thursday sort of gained traction after the Bank of England proffered a gloomy outlook for the UK economy in the aftermath of its decision to also hike interest rates, albeit by 25 basis points to 1%, highest level since 2009, sent the pound sharply lower, and I'll cover that in a minute, um, whereas Chairman Powell of the Fed adopted a somber, somber optimistic tone. He was sort of slightly more upbeat. He was confident that the Fed could achieve a soft landing. And obviously the US economy does appear to be in slightly better shape. We've got US payrolls numbers out later today. And there is some evidence that hiring trends are starting to slow, even if um, inflationary pressures aren't, as we saw from the ISM surveys for both manufacturing and services this week. So, and you've also got a price in the fact that the US economy has a record 11.2 million vacancies, and the UK economy has over 1 million vacancies. So I think the dire outlook painted by the Governor of the Bank of England was probably an overreaction. Yes, there are significant challenges facing the UK economy. I mean, 54% rise in energy bills for a start. Um, that's going to be significantly problematic. It is going to slow down the economy, but at the moment, unemployment still remains at relatively low levels. And I think before unemployment starts to go up, you've got to see those vacancy rates start to come down. And at the moment, they still look in fairly decent shape. So while the Bank of England was really, really downbeat about the last quarter of this year, um, there's still an awful lot of water between now and then. There is still potential for the UK government to introduce further fiscal measures to try and alleviate some of the income squeeze that we're seeing. Some of that will kick in in July when the national insurance thresholds go up. I can't believe that they won't do more because if they don't, they're essentially signing their own electoral death warrant if they don't. So I think at some point there may be further fiscal measures being outlined by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So in the here and now, the key support levels on the major indices are going to be starting with the NASDAQ. We're still above 
this 12,700 level here, which basically I've drawn through these lows through here. And, you know, this, this has been a constant on my chart for quite some time. So we've got that one. It's a similar sort of pattern playing out on the S&P. But again, much will depend on this afternoon's payrolls as to whether or not we hold above this 4,100 level. At the moment, it's intact. But if we do fall below it, and the NASDAQ also falls below its key support level, then we could well see further weakness going forward. And certainly, I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that we could be starting to see a little bit of a slowdown in the US economy after the first quarter contraction um, that we saw from the most recent US GDP numbers. That being said, um, the, un the employment picture, the unemployment picture still looks reasonably positive. For the FTSE 100, that continues to look fairly resilient. It's currently holding above the 50-day moving average, and it's managed to hold above the 200-day moving average. The upper boundary of that is around about the February highs back here. I think there's probably fairly decent support around about 7,200. If we do see a sell-off in US markets, I don't expect it to hit the FTSE 100 anywhere near as hard. However, the Germany 40 or the DAX continues to respect that downtrend line that I drew in from the January peaks. So that continues to look a little bit soft. So I think, you know, looking in the wider scheme of things, if we go all the way back, from where we were, you know, sort of two to three years ago, we're still at fairly decently elevated levels. But if we do drop below this low here from April on the DAX, 13,500, that's the level then I think there's potential for us to see further decline. So keep an eye out on that level if we drift back down there. So I talked about cable. I talked about cable in the context of obviously we've got data coming next week. We've got first quarter GDP numbers. We've also got US CPI. So, you know, the picture for US CPI and UK GDP, it's, um, it, it could determine the direction of the pound. Um, though judging by the breakout that we've seen in the cable this week, I suspect we've got further downside to come. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe that we're above 130, um, you know, less than two weeks ago or two weeks ago. And now we're below 123, 124 and heading towards 122. <clears throat> the next key support level for me Really, I think now that we've broken below this little flag formation here, we had a th strong thrust lower, had a sideways consolidation, and we're getting another thrust lower, which is probably going to be the same sort of distance from here to here. That would suggest that it brings us back to 119.85. Now, I know an awful lot of people won't want to see that, and the only way that I would sort of reverse my call on that is as if we are able to break above this, these twin peaks at 126.20.30. Um, the, these these two impulse highs here. If we can get back above there, then we can delay a downside thrust. Um, 124.90 is also likely to be a bit of a barrier going back. But why is this important? Well, it's important 119.85 for this very reason. Going back to 2016. Okay, so obviously this is quite a longer term chart. 2016 Brexit vote, June, fell down to 119.85 in October flash crash, and then re rebounded, had another test in 2017, formed a base, moved back to 143, 144, came all the way back in 2019 to 119 and a half, rallied off that level again, went back to 130, 160. And then obviously this was the COVID sell-off, which proved to be fairly short-lived in terms of it straddled one week to the next. So you've got two week down thrust to 114, 10, 20, whatever. Um, there's an awful lot of debate as to how low we actually did go uh, on that thrust lower, but we didn't stay down there very long. Came back above it, held back above 119, 85, 80, 85. And since then, we've been all the way back to 142.40. It now looks as if we're going to have a retest of that key level. So based on the price action, based on the strength of the dollar, 
based on the move higher that we've seen in yields this week, um, there is upward pressure on US yields. It's been a bit of a downward pressure on UK gilt yields at the short end because markets are pricing out um, the multiple rate hikes that they had in for the back end of this year, the beginning of next year. You can't really hike rates when the economy's in recession um, because essentially um, you're just exacerbating you're just exacerbating the effect of um, a demand slowdown by doing that, and you don't really want to be doing that. So um, that's going to be the key support level, I think, for me. I think we're likely to see further declines. That appears to be the direction of travel, and it's certainly borne out in terms of the euro dollar chart as well. If you look at the euro dollar chart, you can see a similar sort of price action playing out. I already talked about. The breakout on euro dollar i posted an article euro parity anyone this is why potentially i think we could well see it we traded in a sideways consolidation from the lows back in 20, 2017 2016 to the highs in 2018 we've consolidated in the sideways pattern we've broken out of it we're testing towards the downside initial target is 103.40 but if you extrapolate that out further then you're looking on a measured move basis of a move below parity towards 96.60. Now, you've got to remember this move has taken place over four or five years here between here and here. So any move towards parity and beyond is likely to take place over a similar sort of time frame. Well, not a similar sort of time frame, but certainly over a one or two year period or a six months to 18 months period going forward. What mustn't happen is for us to break back into this triangle. So we could get squeezes back to 108, but that wouldn't negate the triangle breakout that we've seen on this particular pattern. So if we take it back down to a weekly chart, we can see that there's decent support 104.70. We haven't rallied much above 106.40. We'd need to get back above 108.50 to negate this breakout and potentially argue for a delay and a move back to 110, 112. Even with ECB rate hikes, the interest rate differential is still going to be massive when it comes to what the Fed's doing and what the ECB is doing. And the ECB is still deeply negative on its headline rate. So on the basis of this, initial target 103.40, potential parity potentially even lower in the long, in the medium to longer term. Bolly Yen still looking very well bid uh, potential for us to go back to the 2002 peaks of 135 why do i say that well it's quite simple really if we go all the way back here we can see that there's nothing since the 2015 lows the next series of peaks are here january 22 2002 135.04 so that's the next key target for dollar yen um, while we're above the lows here and obviously we're also in a decent uptrend through here but you've got double support at around about 128.60 through there so the dollar is still looking very very bid and that's bad news if you're looking for uh, a significant um if you're looking for a significant move back into um equity markets essentially dollar is tends to be a haven trade the trend for that continues to be higher so let's look at US 10 year yields, because I think the next move here could be significant. This is a monthly chart for 10 year yields. And it, we're approaching a very key level at the moment from the 2013 peaks, the 2018 peaks, and now. Around about 310, 320 on the 10 year. If we break below, if we break through that, then we could see a very really quick move to 4%. Now, if we see a quick move to 4%, then that's going to be good news for the dollar and not much good news for anybody else um, if current price action is any guide. The only time we've been higher than 310 was a brief period back here in 2018 when markets were a little bit concerned about the Fed potentially hiking too aggressively. That obviously hasn't happened and we've dripped, drifted all the way back down, but now we're, we're pushing higher again. So if we get a concerted move through 310, 320, 
then it could be very, very tricky going forward. So I'm paying particular attention to this 10 year yield chart. At the moment, there's a barrier around about 310, 320. But if we break through that on a monthly basis, then it could get it could get pretty messy um, for the US economy as well as pretty much everything else. Um, so so that's that's the sort of the backdrop. So what does it mean for what's coming up next week? Well, obviously we've got payrolls. Um, payrolls data could dictate whether or not we get those breaks lower on the S&P, the NASDAQ and the Dow. Uh, we've got US CPI coming up for April on the 11th, and we've got UK GDP coming up on the 12th. US CPI is going to be interesting because even though Powell's taken 75 basis points off the table, the most recent PPI numbers for March showed a much stronger than expected number of 11.2%, which is another record high. So by that definition, you would expect the US CPI for April to be higher than the 8.5% that it was in March. But expectations for April CPI are for a slide back to 8.1% and core prices to slide back to 6.1%. So maybe a softening of US inflation could pull the dollar back from its currently elevated levels. So, and obviously we have also PPI, US PPI, which is also expected to fall back from 11.2 to 10.7. Now I'd be surprised I'd be more inclined to react to the PPI numbers because they tend to be much more leading indicators. And if we start to see a slowdown in PPI, that's likely to make me slightly more confident that we've hit or are about to hit peak CPI. But that's where we are. So I think much will depend on A, whether or not PPI, CPI continues to rise. Given the numbers from ISM prices paid data this week, I'm in two minds about that. It could go either way. It's still looking very frothy, the prices paid numbers. Um, they jumped back above 84 on both manufacturing and services. And while employment, the employment components of both also softened a little bit from their March numbers as well. So that potentially doesn't augur well for future employment, even with vacancies at 11.2 million. UK GDP, um, again, First quarter GDP, the expectation is for that to soften from the 1.3% we saw in Q4 to 1%. Now, that's optimistic, if I'm honest. Um, on the monthly numbers, we've seen a 0.8% expansion in Jan, a 0.1% expansion in Feb. I'll be very surprised if we see an expansion in March, given the horrible retail sales numbers that we saw for March. 7.2% year-on-year growth in March to 0.9, sorry, from February, 7.2 in February to 0.9% year-on-year growth in March. I mean, that's a big drop, big, big, big drop, big dump, big drop. Um, consumer confidence levels also are the lowest level since October 2020. So again, you know, I'm, I'm in two minds. I think 1.1% expansion for Q1 seems optimistic. And it's not going to get any better from there. So, um, yeah. And also, we've got the fact that the economic outlook with China is zero COVID policy, which is a complete train wreck. It means that any supply chain disruptions and what have you, the EU oil embargo on Russian oil is keeping a, keeping a bit under Brent. So looking at the Brent chart here, we're starting to head back towards the April highs fairly decent support around about $100 a barrel. We don't want to see it go back $120 a barrel. For some reason, oil prices aren't pricing in a China slowdown. So, you know, will Chinese government see the light and drop its zero COVID policy? I can't see that happening in the short term. So that should act as a drag on oil demand, particularly in Asia. Let's hope so, because we need something to keep a cap on oil prices and energy prices more broadly. So let's move on to what's what's uh, what's uh, what I'm looking at on the earnings front. So look at ITV. Well, that doesn't look too great. Um, down at its lows from February, um, that drop there was prompted by 
the announcement of 180 million investment into another streaming service, ITVX, as if they haven't got enough. They've got ITV Hub, ITV Hub Plus, BritBox. Now, what's their long-term strategy? You know, why do they need multiple streaming services? It's almost as if they can't decide what they want to do. The bid for Channel 4, you know, what's that all about? Okay, yeah, you could widen the streaming content, but as we've seen from Netflix's numbers, that's becoming a very competitive market and it's becoming a very low margin market. And ultimately, if you had to choose between dumping Netflix, Disney Plus, or Amazon Prime or BritBox, what would you dump? Well, I wouldn't be keeping BritBox, I'll give you a clue. So I'll be interested to see what the churn numbers are on ITV uh, with their Q1 numbers. Um, revenues last year got a fairly decent boost due to Euro 2020, um, which suggests that the outlook for Q2 this year is likely to suffer from pretty tough comparatives. So worth keeping an eye out for that. But I must admit, I don't see much in the way of encouragement for the ITV share price, particularly if we drop below this key support down here. Continuing the streaming theme, we've obviously got BT Group's four-year numbers. Um, they don't look too bad. Um, they did take a little bit of a nosedive um, at the end of March or beginning of March on the back of the um, disappointment, I think, that they wouldn't be selling their BT Sport um, franchise to DAZN for £580 million. Pounds and that they're in discussions with Discovery to create a sports joint venture, 50-50 split between BT Sport and Eurosport UK. I mean, that's quite a lumpy chunk of change in a very competitive market. I can't help feeling that perhaps that's something they really should have got rid of um, to free up some cash flow to accelerate their FTTP rollout, which is now at six and a half million properties, and it's 5G builds which is proving to be quite expensive. So total revenue for the year um, is expected to come in a little bit lower from last year. Full year outlook for EBITDA is for a number between seven and a half billion pound to 7.7 .7 billion pound. So those numbers are out on the 12th of May. ITV's numbers are out on the 11th of May. Walt Disney, again, it's a streaming theme here um, in light of the Netflix shocker. Um, Q1, Disney saw a big surge in subscribers to 11.8 million. That pushed their total subscribers up to 129.8 million. With its biggest market is India, with its Disney Plus and Hotstar offering, which is for, which has 45.9 subscribers and which operates at a loss. So, um, Disney still maintaining its guidance that it can reach its 230 million subscriber target by 2024. Um, narrator, narrator, basically, Netflix is already not far shy of that at around about 221, even if you count the fact that they lost 200,000 subscribers in its most recent quarter. Also, Disney has the advantage of its theme parks business, which has seen a decent rebound um, in Q1. and its holiday parks business as well. So Disney does have other revenue streams to fall back on and is still expected to make a profit of $1.17 a share. So that's Disney, Disney Plus. Also Disney Plus has improved its content with the addition of the Fox back catalog in the form of Star. Rivian, I'm gonna finish off with Rivian. The electric car maker, that $70, that $78 IPO price seems a long way away now. Um, and even further away is the $179 IPO price spike. Last year, the company lost $4.7 billion on total revenue of $55 million. I mean, that's a big gap. Um, generated by the sale of 920 of its trucks. In terms of orders, the company's got 83,000 of them for its pickups and SUVs. But in terms of annual deliveries, it's going to take some time to actually 
get anywhere close to um, fulfilling them. Um, the company has a target this year of 25,000 um, annual deliveries. So it says it remains on course to deliver 25,000 vehicles this year. A month ago, the company said it had produced 2,000 553 vehicles at its Illinois plant and delivered 1,227 of them. So it's still got quite a way to go. It does have an awful lot of cash to play with. It's got $11 billion worth of cash from Ford and Amazon and $13.7 billion left over from its IPO. And it is looking to spend $5 billion on another factory in Georgia. So overall, it hoping to turn out 150,000 vehicles a year once it's got all of its capacity up to speed but that doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon so we're still expecting to see some big losses here with the shares already at record lows and well below their IPO price it's going to be a similar sort of story for Coinbase obviously direct listing it's now at its record lows sell-off in cryptos the damage to crypto investors from the sell-offs that we've seen in the volatility could well weigh on its Q1 numbers. Um, and as such, we could see further downward pressure on the share price on that when it gets to report its numbers back um, on the 10th of May. So um, that's pretty much it for this week, ladies and gents. Once again, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC markets.